Okay. Now, I just spoke about the voice. There's so much to discuss uh, in it, and I'm sure it's going to dominate a lot of the, the uh, debate this year in politics anyway. And the point is that the voice is not going to change the life, in my opinion, of a single Indigenous person who is living in abject poverty. If we really want to help these people, we have to find other ways of doing so. And it's going to mean a lot of very frank discussions about what the left hopes works, but which the rest of us question, does it actually work? Now, my next guest has written a very important book about Indigenous issues, such as these. It's called The Burden of Culture, How to Dismantle the Aboriginal Industry and Give Hope to Its Victims. I'm delighted to be joined by former Labor Minister Gary Johns. Gary, it's so nice to have you on the show. Thank you. What is this book about and why have you written it? Corey, thanks. Uh, the essence is that most Aborigines are doing just fine. But there's about 20% of Aborigines who literally have been in jail. So the gap is not between Aborigines and other Australians. It's between most all Australians, most Aborigines, and a small proportion of Aborigines. So the question is, what's different about that particular subgroup of Aborigines? And the book addresses that. OK, and what are the differences there? I mean, it's not a lack of money. There are tens of billions of dollars that go into Indigenous um, welfare and issues, policies every single year. It just doesn't seem to be getting to where it's most needed. That's my perception. What's your book find? All right. Well, the key to this is ask successful Aborigines why they're successful. And one of the answers you'll get is that they no longer practice their culture. But the 20%, those who are mainly in remote communities, still practice elements of their culture. And this is the culture that public servants write in their sort of signature block saying we acknowledge culture without having a clue what it means. So I'll just give you two examples, right? Uh, actually, it's a good little film that the Centre for Independent Studies put out last year called Desert Voices. And it's an interview with a woman from Uendamu. She's an art dealer. And she buys art from Aborigines and on sells it and pays the Aboriginal artist. The artists often come back time and time and time again to ask for the same money. And she has to tell them that she's already sold it. So that's our fault. We're not teaching people about how value is created. And as elements of Aboriginal culture, that's called demand sharing or humbugging. But it's common and it's rife. And it was probably useful in a hunter-gatherer society. It's very damaging now. I'll give you a second example of payback, which is also rife in remote communities. So um, that now famous film, Samson and Delilah, uh, that Warwick Thornton, an Aboriginal uh, director, made a number of years ago. The scene is a young Aboriginal woman being beaten up by older Aboriginal women because the young woman's, I think it was grandmother or mother, died in her presence. But the woman died because she had cancer. So it was nothing that that young woman did to harm her mother, grandmother. But there's this simple ignorance of the causation, for instance, of ill health. So, you know, payback based in ignorance, demand sharing, which doesn't understand how value is created. These are burdens. This is old culture and it keeps the 20% down. And why don't the Noel Pearsons and Marcia Langtons of the world fess up that that's what's holding down the relatively few Aborigines who are not doing well in Australia? Well, that's actually a very good question. I wonder why Aboriginal and Indigenous leaders don't speak up about some of the issues. Those that do, of course, if you look at uh, Jacinta Napajimpa Price, uh, are condemned with uh, name calling, they're bullied, they're victimised, they're um, hounded, and you've got to be particularly strong in order to withstand that. Is it cowardice, do you think? Is it the fact that they're on a good, the business that they're in is good enough already and, you know, 80% is better than trying to, uh, achieving an 80% success rate is better than trying to go for 100%. Well, the key to this is, uh, in Aboriginal leadership, you want big numbers. You know, you want to be able to say there are 800,000 or more Aborigines. 
Um, that's just wrong. There are 800,000 people who identify of being of Aboriginal descent, most of whom are doing well. The 20% who are not doing well are living in remote communities. And if you're an Aboriginal leader, you want to point to things that are going wrong because you, the leader, wants to be paid to fix it. You see what I mean? So they make it look like a big problem. 800,000 have got problems and rights. They're not. There are about 80,000 perhaps, 100,000 who are leading miserable lives because they can't break out of that old culture. And my plea to Aboriginal leaders, the East Coast Aboriginal leaders, is just to answer this question. How come you made it? You didn't need any change to the Constitution. You got out with the help of others, mentors, good people and your own efforts and brains. So why don't you teach that trick, if you like, to these poor people, the 20% who are living in remotes? Tell them what the clue is. One of them is dead obvious. If you don't learn to read, write and speak English, you will not make it in this world or in, in this country. Um, so why isn't that constantly reiterated by Aboriginal leadership? And then, this is the kicker, what's stopping that? Well, it's an attitude that the remote Aborigines have learned from their leaders to say, I don't need to play ball. I don't need to do this anymore. I can just be an Aboriginal. Well, it's not enough being Aboriginal. You have to put in and make the same effort, perhaps more, as other Australians if you want to join the 80% of Aborigines who are doing about as well as every other Australian. A hugely important conversation. Gary, quickly, your book, who's the publisher? Where can we get it from? Quadrant Books, uh, and you can get it uh, through Quadrant. A wonderful organisation. Uh, please consider it, read it.